Hello, everyone. Welcome to Word Funk. I am Leon Thomas. I am joined by Austin Yorsky and Johnny Maloney. Done. Hi. <laughs> um, so, guys, uh, I have, like, tons and tons of things to talk about. But I know Austin really, really wants to talk about Fallout 4. So I will open the floor to him. And then when he's done talking about video games, I will tell you about all the good stuff that we're going to talk about this week. <laughs> Uh, Leon, you go make yourself some hot pockets. <laughs> yeah, you, you you go right ahead. You know, you 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 do you right now and tell us about this game that apparently some people have heard of. Look, Fallout Four is the crowd pleaser. On the day it released, like internet traffic dropped substantially, like uh, everywhere. I think that the headline grabber that like I, I know like a couple of big game sites reported was that like porn traffic like went down like twenty five percent or some shit because everyone is too busy playing Fallout to jack it. But for real, uh, Fallout 4 is uh, it's a, it's huge. Everyone in my neighborhood has at least one copy. There are several copies in my house and um, several others as well. It's nuts. Uh, everyone's playing it. Johnny, mm. you've played it. No. No. no I, I assume haven't. Leon has not. So no. I'm the only one. I I somehow somehow the spell has broken for me uh, um, at at long last you know um, the Bethesda I, spell I, the Bethesda spell the Bethesda spell specifically has has broken something very similar happened to me last year with Assassin's Creed um, it took you till last year it did it took me it took me until the release of Unity and you know, like Unity came out Unity and that other one I don't know Renegade Rogue. So, Rogue, thank you, mm-hmm. Rogue. Um, uh, yeah, so Rogue and Unity came out, and I was like, no, fuck it. Well, Assassin's Creed, uh, there's been tons of games, but it hasn't even been out, you know, as a franchise for a decade. So it's, you, mean, it's, you say tons. Do you know how many Assassin's Creed games there have been? I genuinely don't know. I just know that there's a lot. I'm just saying that it's still a relatively new franchise. You may not be burned out on it yet. There have been nine main <laughs> games in the Assassin's Creed series in the eight years the series has existed. Yeah. So they're averaging more than a game a year, and that's the main games. That's, like, specifically major console releases. And I'm, I'm, I just looked it up as I was talking. Uh, that doesn't include two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, thirteen spinoffs on 3DS, PSP, uh, and uh, mobile platforms. So there, there's... 21 Assassin's Creed games that have been made in eight years. The thing about uh, Bethesda games is they only come around every five years or so, right? Like, we only get, like, one Elder Scrolls and one Fallout a generation, so they're pretty special. Um, this one, though, Fallout 4, is, is probably the best-selling of any of their games, uh, maybe except for Skyrim. We'll see if it passes it. But um, it's not reviewing super well, uh, comparatively, I think. I think a lot of people are... Uh, including me, disappointed in it. One, it's even buggier than some of the other games. Like, Bethesda games are notoriously buggy. This one's real bad. Like, I've really? seen some crazy shit. Like, people getting... Um, the funniest thing I saw, my brother was playing, he was running on a bridge, right? And he accidentally hit the melee attack button, so he, his guy, like, swung the butt of his rifle. Suddenly, a raider teleported up through the ground. Remember, he's on a bridge, like... Um, you know, hundreds of feet in the air or whatever, a raider teleports up through the ground and into the butt of his rifle and then explodes, showering him in gore. It was the weirdest thing. Um, there are all kinds of missions that simply won't complete. Um, there's a, there's just a bunch of shit. You can just, like, Google uh, Fallout 4 bugs if you want to see the funnier ones. Um, I will. Not, the one thing that's really widely reported and that I saw in person was someone else was playing it was that early in the game, uh, you, you get like your big cinematic introduction to Death Claws, the iconic Fallout enemy, and it comes from like underground. And I don't know what's wrong with the pathing AI, but they very frequently get stuck and completely ruin that cool moment of it like emerging from the ground to fight you while you're in this super power armor. Uh, this sounds that, like it's going to be a really cool game in three months. Yeah, that's why I wasn't even planning on playing it, right? Because my I knew like the same thing happened with New Vegas, same thing happened with Skyrim. As it came out, it was buggy, and eventually it got patched, and it was perfectly playable. So I said I'm not going to play Fallout 4 at launch, but everyone in my neighborhood has it. There are literally like three copies within like 50 feet of me right now, 
and I can, I can hear in the other room someone else playing it. Like it's it's a nonstop bonanza around me. So I got some time with it, and I like a lot of things it's trying to do, but I feel like they failed with most of them. Like they completely overhauled like the perk um, stat system. I'm not going to like go into huge detail, but I feel like they failed. I saw what they're going for, but it it doesn't work, and I feel like it removes a lot of what makes characters special because there's no level cap, and you can put your every like a level that you get in your perks right into your base stats so you can basically max out everything so making every character like optimal Mm. um another thing is that there's this entire like settlement building system which basically someone during development was like you know what's really popular minecraft and so they put minecraft in the game you can just build these buildings and cities and probably it's it's this like entire thing and like i get it but they need to completely overhaul the ui to make it work Right now, it's super cumbersome. Um, there, there's other things like there's weapon mods, but like the the once again, like the UI doesn't know favors. It's like a pain in the ass sort of searching through everything. Um, there's the usual Bethesda problems, or all the characters are really thin and the writing isn't great, and there's really weird stilted conversations. I, I could go on. Right? As well as the sticker that shows up like right on on the outside of the box that just says, "Don't worry, we'll fix it in mods." Yeah, all three had a uh, Liam Neeson famously uh, starring in it. Who is like the big actor they got for this one? Um, I genuinely don't know. Honestly, I don't think they got anyone big because there's no like notable dialogue. Like after Linda the, Carter's in it. After the opening like five minute scene, which is no replacement for the goddamn tunnel snakes who ruled <laughs> ruled real hard in Fallout Three. They kind of just dump you into the wasteland, and there's no tutorial for, like, the settlement shit. And they just say, like, run around. That We know that's all you want to do. Like, there's there's no notable characters. Like, no one has any personality. The story is, like, bare bones. Um, like, it's not even, like, spoilers to say that, like, you spend the whole game looking for your kid, and then eventually you find them. Like, it's, it's like, the compared to the the most cliche thing which is like your spouse has been killed get revenge which is i mean blah 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 like find your kid is the second most cliche thing they possibly could have done with the story it's like not even worth making fun of hey, uh, yeah but 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 austin austin this is like such a huge departure from fallout 3 which was obviously find your dad <laughs> real real mix up formula yeah yeah i mean you know like who would have expected it's like it's like an Elder Scrolls game where you're in jail at the beginning, and then it turns out you have a great destiny. Oh, jeez, man! It's I've oh. never seen anything like it before. I blew it. No, I'm just saying I could record an entire hour long podcast detailing my thoughts on the ten hours I played a Fallout Four, um, because it has a lot of problems. But that said, I played ten hours and I want to play more of it because it has that you know addictive quality that most Bethesda games do, um, and I just kind of like the genre, so it's not like I hate it, it just has a lot of problems. So it's, that, that is more or less what I what I expected the game to be. I mean, you know, when they announced it back at, like, I can't even remember when they announced it, but... Um, well, here's the thing, is that we knew Fallout 4 existed and was set in Boston like four years ago yeah. when Kot- Kotaku linked it, which is actually a story that's kind of blowing up right as we speak. Mm. Because Kotaku wrote a, a, a statement today talking about how they were blacklisted by Bethesda because of it and have since been blacklisted by Ubisoft for leaking uh, Assassin's Creed um, Syndicate. Mm-hmm. Um, so we can definitely talk about that stuff. You guys want to talk about ethics and games journalism again? Oh, God, please. <laughs> but, um, you know, the, the, the point that I, I wanted to um, – Again, I was is that I, I when I first learned about it, I was like, you know, I, I I know this game though. Before it even came out, before we'd seen anything about it, I was like, I I know this. I've played this game before. They're going to boost. They're going to boast like slight tweaks, tweaks to the AI and systems. Not necessarily improvement, just tweaks. They're going to change it a little bit. They're going to be like, ooh, it's our biggest ever, like, you know, if it's our biggest game ever, or it's our biggest Fallout game ever, or it's, you know, like, the biggest draw distance that they've had ever. And I was like, they're not going to ditch that old fucking engine, which I think is like 25 fucking years old now. Gambrio for life. Yeah, you know, like, it's going to come out, it's going to be buggy, they're going to price it at like 70 or 80 bucks, and I was like, you know what? 
No. Oh, Canada. I, I can't. I can't step into that again. Like it's, speaking I, of eighty bucks, Fire Emblem Fates just went up for pre-order. It's eighty bucks for all that from the mm. 3DS. Oh man, that's killer. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. How's your dog? Uh, dog meat in Fallout 4 is unkillable. Oh. Actually, that's one of the one of the um, choices they made, which I totally understand and makes perfect sense on paper, but in execution feels kind of weird. Is that y- all of your AI companions are invincible? Yeah. Um, the reason that they put out was that because anytime dog meat blew up, which is often in the old games, people just reloaded their save file. And like, yeah, I get it. Like, you're just removing an annoyance. But seeing your dog take a nuke to the face and kind of just slump over and, like, wait for you to run over and revive him is weird and immersion-breaking, kind of. Um, So, like, I get it, and I don't have a better solution, but it's not... This isn't so much an improvement as, like, just a different way to handle it. I mean, I had a similar problem when I uh, tried to kill Liam Neeson. I mean, in the game. (laughs) Uh, mm-hmm. Not like in real life. Uh, yeah, that went totally differently, as I recall. Yeah, um, Taken Four went in a really strange direction when Leon showed up. I liked it though. I uh, I just I just just kept trying to just murder him, and he kept like turning to me and like that's not very nice of you. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and, but I eventually got all of his health down, and he slumped down, and then he got right back up, as I recall. That's so. the way all Bethesda games have been since Morrowind. In Morrowind, when you killed a, a story NPC, like a message popped up, and it's like you've severed the uh, thread of fate or something. Reload an yeah, old it basically, file. It, it basically told you it was like you can keep playing if you want, but uh, the game's unwinnable now. So, yeah. which is once again, that's that's a way to handle it. I don't know if it's better or worse than the new solution, which is make NPC uh, like critical NPCs immortal. Um, but it is a solution, I guess. So the other thing that I want to touch on was the, the another decision they made to Fallout 4, which was to lean into the hoarding thing. Like if you've ever played a Bethesda game or like even know someone who has, you've probably heard about how that you pick up everything because there's thousands of things in the environment and then you come over encumbered and then you have to like play this elaborate uh, inventory mini game to figure out what you're going to leave behind. But instead of getting rid of that, they just said, uh, everything is valuable now because you need it for crafting. So just take everything and make a thousand trips. Um, so that I guess they like, tried to give it purpose, uh, but all they've done now is made the game a goddamn nightmare for like completionist OCD people. Um, so like now every time you fill your inventory, you feel like you're making an accomplishment instead of just being a weird hoarder, but you're also always leaving shit behind that you feel like you need. <sighs> God, yeah. I'm sorry. That's a shame. I do like I feel, it, but... I feel like I've made the right choice. I, I feel like deciding to, like, keep my hands out of it until... Because, I mean, you know, there's there's certain... I, like, I mentioned on the podcast a little while ago before it came out that I was like, how come they're not doing anything with it? Like, you know, how come they're not adding multiplayer? And then someone wrote in the comments section, like, why would you add multiplayer to a Fallout game? And the thing is, is I'm not talking about, like, Deathmatch or something like that, but if you could play, like, a two-player cooperative open-world Bethesda game, that would at least be something new. That would be something different, that you could, like, wander around the wasteland with a buddy, that you could take on that that, that Bethesda environment with a friend, you know? Honestly, that would that be, like, be too far out, because a lot of what Fallout 4 is doing is aping those survival crafting games that are so popular yeah. on Steam right now, and most of those are multiplayer. They dumps, like, eight people onto a server, and there's a large open area, and there's a thousand items to pick up and to turn into stuff. Yeah. Like, it, it totally would make sense if Fallout had a, a component like that. I, I'd, I'd love to see them, like, take that extra step, because at this point in time, every time, ever since Morrowind, it seems, all they've done is boast small graphical improvements, tweaks to the UI, and then, like, small changes to mechanics. But even I'd, like, then, like, I'd, I'd love forward. to be able to... I, I just, I'd, like, I'd love to be able to come to a game and be like, wow, for once, a Bethesda game has blown me away with its writing, or, like, they've really changed this, or they've really changed that. And it's, I, it's just not happening. I think it's a common criticism that they only kind of up the graphics and stuff, but it's not even that big of an improvement. Like, Fallout 4 is kind of ugly, honestly. It doesn't look good. 
And the UI is a huge step down from Skyrim, which I thought was honestly the, the one of their better ones. Like, I haven't come off of, like, a similar big-budget kind of RPG shooter thing uh, in Destiny, which I have a ton of problems with as well. But that game had a fucking gorgeous user interface and top notch notch textures that was harder to say than i thought um and i honestly going from destiny to fallout 4 was like oh god we've gone back an entire console generation it it felt like honestly so uh, i don't even think they're making the kind of marginal improvements that everyone uh, expects Mm. they're not improvements my point is that this they've added stuff but it's not better it's just different yeah and that's, I mean, you know, like, uh, I, I kind of feel like, at least from a, from a PC playing standpoint in time, ever since Oblivion, that hasn't really changed much. I mean, you know, the, the Oblivion UI was way better than the Morrowind AI. The Morrowind AI was obtuse. Or UI, sorry, not AI. UI was obtuse. Uh, and Oblivion was a lot more like, oh, okay, like, here's your inventory list, here's this, here's that, you know? Like, it was, very easily put out there. And since then, it's like, okay, let's kind of do that, only different. Mm-hmm. And so, Skyrim, Fallout 3, like, none of it was better. It was just different. So, I'm sorry for dragging this on for, like, ten minutes. The last thing I'll say, and then we can move on, is okay. that I, I don't hate a lot of the choices in Fallout 4, and I think they, a lot of them can be fixed with patches, so I think it's going to be a much better game in a couple months. But I think going forward, they need to decide what kind of game they're going to be. If they want to be like a story, lore-rich RPG, they need to really focus on getting back to the kind of single-player experiences and the, the deeper writing that characterize a lot of the, the Western RPG, right? Like things like The Witcher. They really need to, to double down on that if they're going like- to it. Or every Bioware game ever made, except yeah. for Mass Effect 3. <laughs> which is a whole other kettle of fish. Or, if they're going in this new direction, which is fine, if they want to be like Rust or Daisy or that Ark dinosaur game, where it's kind of like no one has personalities, you're just running around in a big space collecting shit and fighting, that's fine. But be better at it. Like actually have a working interface and yeah like maybe add multiplayer or something that's that's totally a, a decent formula for a video game it doesn't feel like fallout but uh, i mean it's if you make a good game you make a good game and i'll give you credit for that right now it's like a weird ungainly hybrid and I'll, although i'll probably put like 50 hours into it because i'm a sick masochist when it comes to six series i like uh it's really not doing it for me in the current iteration I, ju- I just want to see them take a step forward. Like, I, I really do. Not like a shuffle, like a full-on step. They, I mean, they're like, like steps. They're just Minecrafty steps. They're, they're like, those are like lateral steps. They're not forward steps, you know? Like, it's, it's just kind of like, it's, it's widening the game experience that they have as opposed to like, you know, like, I guess part of my problem is that I remember Bethesda as being a company that, that pioneered these, like, games that nobody else was making. And people are knocking at the door now. Mm. And they're, yeah. they're, not, they're not doing anything about it. They're going, oh, okay, well you, well, you liked Fallout 3. Do you like Fallout 3 with Minecraft? Whatever. I, I wonder how much of the old team members are, are there. You know who used to work for Bethesda? And this is a true fact. Uh, Courtney Cox. Huh. The, the actress. I don't know what she did there. I just remember reading that once. And, I really... and Linda, Linda Carter, who was Wonder Woman, uh, she's actually married to one of the guys that works there, which is why she's in every single one of their games. <laughs> Wonder Woman! Well, that's cool. Yeah. All right. Sorry for taking up so much of your life, Leon. You'll never get any of that back. So I appreciate it, Austin. I appreciate it because I feel vindicated now. I feel like I've made the right decision, and I'm, like, doubling down now in my zealotry over waiting until Fallout 4's price drops, or at least maybe until mod tools come out. That's the thing, though. You will play it eventually. This is not a train that we can get off. <laughs> oh, no, no. This is like – but but this is me saying, you know what, I, I don't want to pay that much for the ticket. Yeah. Because well, I didn't pay for the ticket. Like I said, I, I'm a leech in this situation. Unintentionally. I had every intention of getting it on a Steam sale someday, but now I didn't need to. Um, Leon, if it makes you feel any better, yeah. you can you can date a robot in Fallout 4. I want to just in Fallout 4. 
And yeah. and also and also Leon, you can get a robot to call you Furiosa. Which I did. My character in Fallout 4 is named Furiosa. Congratulations, as as I, Austin. As soon as I heard that, I was like, I got it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean, fuck. I'm still, I think about Fury Road like two hours a day minimum. <laughs> okay. I come home and I look at my Blu-ray of it sometimes. Okay. All right. Bed. Thank you. Um, anything else we want to say about Fallout 4 before I move on to my shit? Stop encouraging us. Take it. Take the ball and run before we take it back. Because okay. I'll go on. Okay, guys. Uh, I have an important question for you. It's about what? No, it's y'all ready for this? I'm talking about Space Jam. I want, <laughs> I want Space Jam. Um, I haven't seen it for a long time, but I've I held on to the belief that it's an awesome movie. It's not. Uh, but. <laughs> <laughs> it did not age well at all. What, and, I, and frankly, what, the uh, the weird angles and style choices of it, I'm not a fan of. But I have a lot of questions I want to ask you guys uh, in rapid succession, and you'll have no chance to answer them. You're just going to have to absorb all these questions. Why do all the Monstars jerseys have zeros on them? Wouldn't that make it hard to tell them apart? Also, what if one of them had a great career and they needed to retire the jersey number? How would they do that? If the Looney Tones started walking out of their cartoons in the middle of the action to do their union meeting, which is what they do in the movie, does that mean they are always reenacting these decades-old cartoons every day? What if two separate Looney Tunes cartoons are playing on different channels somewhere in the world at the same time and both star the same Looney Tune? Are there multiple Foghorn Leghorns? No time to answer. More. If the Looney Tunes world is at the center of the Earth, is it really hot? Why did the boss of Moron Mountain not enslave the Looney Tunes even after they won the basketball game? He's clearly evil, and there is no written contract. Why can't Michael Jordan act even a little bit? Why does the, <laughs> why does the referee allow so many blatant fouls, including but not limited to firing guns on the court? Is Marvin the Martian the referee because he is both a Looney Tune and an alien, and therefore impartial? If so, is Moron Mountain part of the Martian Dominion? If not... Aren't we just stereotyping him as just some sort of broad alien? Why is Moron Mountain called Moron Mountain? Seems like it would be really bad business practice to insult your paying customers. The bad guy boss says, in the beginning, the customer's always right. This seems like a contradiction. I have more, but I feel like I've made my points. I thought you were going to make a joke about the sexy rabbit at some point, and you no, didn't. No, I, I don't care. Whatever. I mean, you know, she, she you know. Was I'm it that start, it was... I'm going to start with the third question. Okay. Uh, and, and I believe the answer is um, Greek. I don't even remember what the third question was. Neither do I. I'm just throwing something out <laughs> no, there. No. Cool. Um, cool. Cool, 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 I thought that Space Jam was pretty baller when I saw it in second grade. No, wait. <laughs> no, shit. Was that middle school? I don't remember. I was very young. I haven't watched it since. Uh, it's, so you're saying it doesn't hold up, not even like in like an ironic way? No, no. Uh, it has serious problems. Really, just the way everything is shot is awful. Um, it's also not funny, which is not a thing you want in a comedy. Uh, but, but, but um, I don't know. Uh, for some reason, I just kind of enjoyed watching it in sort of like a facepalm kind of way. Um, it has the worst credit sequence uh, for a Looney Tunes movie. It's just Michael Jordan clips um, and, and a woman saying, saying uh, welcome to the Space Jam. It's time to do your dance and something pants. Uh, I don't know. I, I forget the, all the lyrics. Um, I just You've just given me like the weirdest craving to go hunting through a box in my storage to find my Color Me Bad cassette tape. <laughs> and if there are any like hyper color shirts and bike shorts that I have... God, I <sighs> slap bracelets. Hey, wait, no. I say we talk about nostalgic stuff on the show a lot, but I just got like a really weird like deja vu. We're talking about this. Like I very distinctly remember talking about this on a playground at, and it was middle school. I remember like I have a very strong image of like a chain link fence suddenly. Like this is weird because it was. Yeah. I'm jogging your memory here. It is. It's all coming back now. Okay. <laughs> I haven't thought of it in so long. Like, it's such a weird thing, right? Like, the marketing and the the, the t- professional basketball and the, the cartoon tie-in, like, would wh- wh- how did it happen? Who let it happen? Yeah, it, it's weird. It's like someone either was in a meeting and they said, at, like, at, at Warner Brothers and said, we want to do something with Michael Jordan, and then they thought of Looney Tunes, or someone was in a meeting at Warner Brothers and said, we want to do something with Looney Tunes, and then they thought of Michael Jordan. So, 
Was it super successful? I, 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 it did okay. I mean, it was a Looney Tunes movie, so you, you think, I mean, I, I was solid in the theaters. Uh, I prefer like, to, I prefer to imagine that it was, it was a meeting in a, a business office, in a very high rise business office, and one of them was like, God damn it, we've gotta think of some way to reach the kids with this, I don't know, this, this thing that's hip and, and, and cool and young, but then maybe find this other thing that's like, not so hip that we could get for cheap and hmm and like some guy walks to a window and then there are these two like billboards and like maybe Michael Jordan with like a McDonald's endorsement or something like that and then maybe a like local access show or, or a TV channel that was like billboards oh the Looney Tunes on at three and he's like wait a goddamn minute <laughs> um, I'm just thinking if it was if it was pretty popular and successful and lucrative like were there a bunch of knockoffs like whatever happened to that kind of like synergy it, it was movie? profitable i just looked it up the budget was uh 80 million uh which uh is a lot you know i mean it's not a lot for today. A cartoon? yeah for for basically a, li- a live action thing with like no big stars uh and it um hey hey bill murray was in it he he, he shut was, your mouth boy he was in it but it was, it was by 1996 he was not that big of never mind oh look not, not, that's not the point the point is that it made 250 million dollars out of the 80 so yeah it, it did very well uh, for itself um there is allegedly a sequel but we're we're just sort of sitting on our butts waiting for that um many 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 years afterwards so uh the space jam website still exists i believe um, yeah, I've heard, I heard about that before. I, didn't it get taken down recently? Wait, it did it? Oh, oh no. Maybe. No! We're all now frantically going to Google to find Space Jam website. I, I am. Oh, no, it's still there. Um, it, it, <laughs> it's awesome. Okay. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, <laughs> that's looking a bit dated there. Oh, uh, there's, even, there's even a site map button. <laughs> I haven't seen a site map button since like 1999. Oh my god, someone made this on GeoCities or something. Okay, um, so that's all I wanted to say about Space Jam. I have like tons of other things I want to talk about. <laughs> that was quite a detour to, to just say, I saw an old movie. Yeah. Um, basically, uh, uh, someone on Twitter, uh, an artist I talk to occasionally, uh, she says, hey, today's the 19th anniversary of Space Jam. <laughs> and I said, I could watch Space Jam, and then I did. Um, so that's that's what precipitated that. Um, I do have two Baltimore stories. One's okay, and the other one is the best one of all time. So I'm are gonna you, start. Like, I, are you, are you sure that you're setting you're not setting us up to be disappointed because you've had some pretty good Baltimore stories in the past, Leon? You you don't understand. The first one's okay, but the second one sounds like it's the like the twist. In a, if if the Baltimore stories were a movie, this would be like the moment like 15 minutes before the movie's over where everyone in the audience goes, oh, that's ironic. Are and you going to give us the M. Night Shyamalan? Some, something's going to happen. Are you gonna, are you going to give us a red-hot M. Night Shyamalan? <laughs> I, I just... Are you gonna give us a red hot stiff M Night Shyamalan? <laughs> okay, all right. Let me let me go through both of the stories. The first one's okay, and it's about Crime House. Um, I parked up uh, next to Crime House, and uh, a truck pulled up near me, and it was a woman, and she was just waiting in the car. And then two guys came out of Crime House, and they were holding. And I'm trying to trying to you know trying to describe this, but it's hard for me. It's a long um, suitcase, briefcase, storage thing that is that has hexagonal. It's shaped hexagonally, but it's three dimensional. And it's long. And I don't know what it is. Was it it a coffin, Leon? (laughs) No, 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 no. Um, It was like, no, I don't mean it it looked like a coffin. I mean, it looked like... uh, Because uh, what you're describing to me, you know, a long, (laughs) hexagonal thing, that sounds like a coffin. If it was a coffin, it was only for a child. Um, but it was, it was, it was white. Okay, well, the plot deepens then. <laughs> they, um, they carried it to, uh, the woman in the car, and were basically advertising it to her. I didn't stick around very long after that. I got out of there. Um, I don't know how that transaction ended, or what was in the hexagon, <laughs> but, um, I'm afraid. Um, but that's not the big story. Um... So here's what happened in Baltimore last night. 
or, te- or technically early this morning. Um, so wait, is this? Are we moving on to the second story now? This, this is this is the one where it's embarrassing for me to talk about, but I'm going to do it. Um, it better end with someone doing a sweet flip over like a flaming bear or something, because you build no, it up. No, I want. Not, I not, want a resolution of Leon's poop issues. No, <laughs> I'm sorry. What? I, the, you know, the resolution about the person who keeps putting poop in your trash. Oh, no. This is related to other things I've talked about on, on Baltimore Stories, but it's not related to poop. It's uh, It only happened for a moment, but it's tragic. So here's what's happened. Um, late last night, I had to uh, – this is not a big deal. It's just going to sound like it is. I had to drive someone how, – how, how late? 11 o'clock. At 11 okay. o'clock at night, I had to drive someone to the hospital. Not for a big thing. It was just something that needed to be checked out. And a few hours later, I got a call that says, okay, you can pick me up now. Everything's fine. So I got in my car, and bear in mind, late at night, I can't park near my home because it's late and people park and there's just no space. So I had to park like a block away. So I had to walk about a block to my car at 2 a.m. in the morning. And as I was walking down the sidewalk, a car pulled up next to me, and a man rolled down his window, and he said, do you fuck around? And I looked at him and I said, what? And he's, and he looked at me like real serious and like in a sexy voice. And he said, do you fuck around? And I, and I couldn't understand what was happening. And I said, say again. And he said, do you fuck around? And I said, I don't know what you're talking about. And then he drove away. But I do know what he's talking about. He thought I was a prostitute. Um, he thought I was a prostitute in my neighborhood filled with prostitutes. This is the time of night when guys go trolling for gigolos. Um, so it would have been better if I had said no, but instead, um, all of my encounters with prostitutes in my neighborhood have been turned around on me in some sort of, like, ironic robot devil way, where now at least someone in my neighborhood thinks I'm the hooker. So that's what I'm dealing with right now. In can, you, can this episode be called I'm a Hooker? No. <laughs> no. It's absolutely not going to be. Um, anyway. Here's the thing, Leon. Yeah. What? What, were you? How were you dressed? Yeah, I know. <laughs> I was, I'm not saying you're. I'm not saying you were asking for it. Right. I'm just curious. I know, and that's the weird thing. I was wearing a black shirt and jeans. That's it. I, Hot. Yeah. No, I I, I was dressed. Were I, you like? Were, were you, you like on? languidly sucking on some kind of popsicle no, or like? No, and that's that's the weird a, thing. A corn dog or something like that, no, or that's that's the odd thing. And I I learned this by asking someone uh, earlier. And here's the thing about the difference between female and male sex workers uh, in terms of just like streetwalkers, not like you know in nice bordellos or whatever. Um, <laughs> the difference between male and, and female streetwalkers, and I'm going to try to say this as nicely as I can, because as I, we've said many times on this show, when we have to talk about prostitutes, I don't have anything against prostitutes. They have to make a living. Um, so I'm going to say this really nicely. But based on my personal experiences, of which there are many in seeing prostitutes in my neighborhood, they are all dressed like prostitutes. Uh, <laughs> they wear clothes that you see on Law and Order SVU when the detectives need to talk to people who need to look like TV prostitutes. So I'm talking about skin tight, pink, uh, leopard kind of pants, a tube top when it's cold, a leather jacket over the tube top, and weird shoes. So that's what prostitutes in my neighborhood look like. They look like TV prostitutes. Um, male prostitutes, I have learned in my neighborhood, look clean. That is the word that I've been told. Male prostitutes have to look clean. And apparently, I looked a little too clean to be walking around in my neighborhood 
at 2 a.m. to not be a hooker. That's weird, and I didn't realize that was that was a distinction. And I and for any sex workers who are listening to this who think that might not be true, feel free to comment in our, in our comments and let me know uh, that that's not accurate. But this is what I I've mean, been told. I'm sure there are always exceptions, but sure. I, isn't isn't the difference in dynamic for like um, I'm obviously speaking in generalizations? But I would imagine being a female prostitute is kind of a, a buyer's market, right? Like there's a lot more competition. There are a lot more straight men looking for women at any given time. So you feel like you have to advertise more. Hmm. You have right? to make sure they know. Yeah. You can't afford to be, uh, you know, selective. And I feel like, um, and I have no data to back this up. This is the first thing that popped into my mind. Hmm. But like usually, right, there's no way, there's no like nice way to say this. Uh-oh. Like, I'm just saying there's, like, a stereotype about gay men, about, like, flamboyance and such, and you don't want to, like, draw attention to yourself and get hate crime, right? Ah, uh, I see what you're saying. So I, I looked too um, I looked too straight. <laughs> you, you look too straight, which, so you're which, obviously which, gay. Which is not a thing people often say about me. Uh, so, you see what I'm saying, though? Like, unless you're in, like, San Francisco or something, or, like, where there's, like, a gay community for, like, support, if you're just, like, a random gay person out being stereotypically gay, you're drawing attention from both police and homophobes, mm-hmm. and that's a dangerous situation to be in. Is that, is that out of line to say that? No, no, I, I guess I understand what you're saying. Okay. That, that... That's, why I, that's why I'd rather go to the bathhouse. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Controlled environment, you know? Oh, my God. Um... So, anyway, that was my uh, encounter with someone who thought I was a prostitute. And the, here, here's the, uh, that's not the saddest part about this, uh, you know, because whatever. I mean, life's weird enough as it is. This is just another thing that happened to me. Um, the, the worst part about this is, um, this is the first time someone has shown any romantic interest in me <laughs> uh, since getting a divorce. <laughs> so then that was it. Well. Uh, Leon, I'm not sure we should go so far as to describe what happened to you as romantic interest. <laughs> okay, sexual interest so, and, and, and any kind of vague attraction. Uh, it may and, have been. It may have been economic. I like, look, you know, but, like let's say, let's say, for example, you were like, you're actually making this uh, worse, Johnny. No, I'm just, I'm asking. I'm, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious like, about the. Like, what if he tried to haggle with you? I mean, you know, like. How much? How much, Leon? Would it have taken him <laughs> to convince you? Um. <laughs> that's fair. That's a fair question. How much? <laughs> how much would it take for? Was me he a handsome man? Him? Was he a handsome man? It was hard. It was hard. To, it was really late. I couldn't tell. Um. Listen, everyone will fuck around eventually. Did he, did he have a sex? Did he have a sexy voice? Could he like? Could he read he, like a, a letter to you? And you'd be like, mm, "No, yeah. he was yelling at me." Um, so so I, discreet then. I don't find that attractive. I find that really aggressive when when anyone is like. I, I find ag- aggressive behavior not attractive. I guess is what I'm trying. That's to. why you're supposed to say like, "Hey, do you party?" Or like, are hey, you, you, hey, do you, hey, do you party? Could also mean drugs, though. That I've, I've, yeah, or like, are you cool or something? There's like a couple of like chill ways to like see if someone's down for something like that. Yeah, he's like, like F-word. do you fuck around? That yeah. sounds like, are you like? That's almost like a something a gang member yells to another gang member, like, are you fucking around in my territory? Like, I'll fuck you up. Like yeah. that is not that is not a seductive. That is not an erotic posture to start yeah. an interaction with. No. Um. So that happened. Um, anyway, uh, that was it. By the way, I don't have an answer to the how much money would it, would it, would it take for me to have sex for money. Um, that's one of those things you don't know until you're in this situation, right? Right. I mean, look, I, look, much, much like the million dollar man once said, everyone has their price, but, um, I, it, it would take a lot for me to basically risk incarceration because once, once that kind of thing is on my record, it's like, that's that's part of me every time I have to apply for a job. And I, I'm just really, as I've said many times in the past, I'm just really, really afraid of ever being arrested for anything. Uh, so, yeah, uh, I, I don't know. I don't know what it would take for me to risk something like that. But my finances are pretty good these days, so I don't I th- know. I think it's also, I mean, you know, it's pretty context-dependent, I think. Hmm. 
Because it's, it's a big difference to, like, you know, have an intellectually stimulating evening with, you know, someone that inevitably leads to some kind of intercourse as opposed to, like, a swift stick in the alleyway with, I don't know, um, like Steve from The Butchers. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty particular about uh, protection as well. So, and so I, I have to sort of trust someone to, like, always be, like, you know. So, I don't know. That would that would be a tough one. Anyway, uh, that's what I wanted to say about a uh, guy wanting my butt <laughs> for money. Leon, Leon Thomas, Quantum Gigolo. <laughs> All right, that's the title. <laughs> Quantum Gigolo. Okay. All right. Yeah, because because you know, like, well, you had a gigolo experience, so but you are not a gigolo, so right. it's, you are and are not a gigolo. And then, like, somebody opened the box and was like, oh, he's not a gigolo. Okay. That, that, that's, I'll, I'm going to write that down because that's, <laughs> that, that's almost certainly going to be the title. Um, <laughs> I have to make sure I spell gigolo right. All right. Um, anyway, um, those are the main things I wanted to talk about. Um, I did, I had this whole routine I was building up over the course of the past few days about how weird it is that I always get crushes uh, on girls who work at Taco Bell. But um, <laughs> I've decided that I don't know if I can, like, stretch that out to a few minutes where it's funny. Um, so it's, it's, just, it's just a weird thing that on three uh, separate non, uh, non-consecutive occasions, I've, I've gone to a Taco Bell and gone, ooh. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> You want to run your stand-up routine by us? <laughs> no, it was, like, it, was like, it was just something I've been thinking about the past few days. I'm like, oh, I should talk about this on Word Funk. It sounds funny. There's, like, there's a lot of material there. I'm finding that there isn't. It's <laughs> I don't know how to explain it. It's probably just a coincidence. Taco Bell is like my cheat day uh, food, so yeah. I think I've only ever been into one Taco Bell in my life. Well, there, there are not as uh, as many in Canada, right? No, there there are not. Yeah, which makes it increasingly difficult to run for the border. Yeah. Oh well. Okay, so uh, that's what I wanted to talk about. And, uh, that's it. Uh, Johnny, do you have any topics you want to talk about, or should we jump, jump to our questions? Um, I don't know. Like, I had a, I had a pretty uneventful week. I finally saw Jupiter ascending on the, oh. on last weekend. I saw Jupiter ascending. Oh, you did that on purpose. Huh? Yeah, I, yeah, yeah, I guess I kind of did it on purpose. Cause, I mean, everybody that I had spoken to or I had heard speak on the matter was like, it was like, it it was like falling in love with a beautiful train wreck. Yeah. You know, so I was like, I, I kind of feel like I need to see this movie. Um, and I'm I'm trying to remember what it was that I said to my friend Christian about the movie. Um, I do remember telling him that my new hip hop outfit is going to be called Space Roller Blades. <laughs> um, here here's here's my thing about Jupiter Ascending. I uh, I heard it was like hilarious, so I went and saw it. Um, I didn't enjoy it in a so bad it's good way though. I just, I just, I just found it really boring. Uh, after like the first twenty minutes, it was just, it was just a big headache for me. I don't know how you felt about it, Johnny, but I, uh, I have no like, um, hip love for it, like where it's so bad. But no, it just wasn't. I wasn't feeling it at all. It, it seemed to me it was like somebody was like, I wonder how we can make space or like how we can combine the thrill of aristocracy with the nail biting excitement of genes <laughs> and space all together. Because obviously the three of those things are equally as exciting. I feel pretty and, bad for uh, Mila Kunis, and then, but I feel like she's big, because of this is the only really big one that she was like the star in the past couple of years, and now it's, and like that and Ted, I guess. I, I got to admit, I didn't really ironic and enjoy it like other people, but I was kind of transfixed by it. Hmm. It was it was sort of fascinating, but then at the same time, I just like like what I wanted. I wanted to see the movie being made. I wanted to see the script being written. Like, that's a, um, that's a movie that I'd really like to see the making of. 
Well, the weird behind, thing, behind the scenes doesn't. interviews with everybody and things like that because, like, I just want to know what was going through through people's heads. Well, the the version that we see is actually the version after they've seen the original and said we need to push this back by several months and change a lot of things. So we're seeing the improved version. Yeah, we're, we're, they Southland tails it, didn't they? Yeah. Um. Apparently, the, the yeah the uh they try to make it better. I don't. I but I don't know. I mean, maybe maybe the original version makes more sense. But this one was the streamlined version. I, I I genuinely don't know. I I don't know if there's like a director's cut of it. I saw just the theatrical version of it. So, but yeah, I, that was um, that was a I, I that was an experience in basically watching too many ideas happen all at once. Mm. That's like that's really the the only way that I can describe it was that it was kind of like watching somebody have two thoughts at the same time, possibly even three, and then trying to describe all of those ideas in the same paragraph, even though they were like unrelated. Mm. Um, yeah, so that was uh, that was weird. Um, there wasn't really there wasn't really much else this week uh, that that's sort of like word funk worthy, you know, which I guess says a lot. Um, about what I'm like. Now that's not really worth talking about on Word Funk. Mm. So it's um I'm looking forward to Jessica Jones coming out tomorrow. Probably gonna binge watch that. I mean not in a day, but you know. Uh that comes out in two hours and then I'm I then I'm, I'm gonna watch all of it. I'm gonna watch I, all of it. <laughs> I gotta go to I gotta go to Kung Fu tonight and then I gotta work tomorrow, but then, you know, at least by Saturday I'm sure I'll have it probably all done. But uh, yeah, I started playing Pillars of Eternity again because um, I never I never quite finished that. Um, can't remember why I never really started it. I think it was because I was waiting for the 2.0 patch, and then by that point in time, I ah, it's a it's a story that's not worth telling. Dang, my my life has been pretty chill lately. You know, it's um, I'm even like I'm I'm trying out a new sleep experiment, which is. You know, working out, but I mean that's not exciting to talk about. Yeah. It's just like I'm, I'm, I'm sleeping better because I've changed the way that I go to bed. Well, that's good. I, it's, it's, yeah. I mean, you know, like because my my brother went through this uh, like period a number of years ago, um, not long after my father died, where he's having real trouble sleeping, and he he wound up getting medical assistance for it. He went to like a sleep study at at, at our local university and things like that, and he got this like page long list of like the do's and don'ts about how to properly manage your sleep. Where, you know, you're supposed to do things like make sure that you always get up at the same time, or you always go to bed at the same time, that you have a routine that you do before your bed every single night, that uh, you don't do these things in the bedroom, that you try and keep your lights dim in the bedroom when you're trying to sleep, like close your blinds, turn your clocks off, you know, like it was a huge fucking list. And I was like, I got to do all that to get better sleep? No, that sounds like way too much work, you know, but I, uh, I was, I was speaking to, uh, uh, someone recently who was a bit of an authority on the subject matter and was like, okay, well, let's dispel some ideas about this. And he clarified some of these things that I had heard. And I was like, oh, that's actually kind of fascinating. So I, I'm, I've actually got like these actionable things that I'm doing before I go to sleep that are actually helping me sleep. Like if you're feeling anxious about what you have to do tomorrow, you make a list of things that you have to do, but not just what you have to do, methods in how like how you can do them and solve them. So it's like, oh crap, I've got to go to the bank tomorrow and then I have to do this and this and this. You make a list like an hour before you go to bed and be like, I'll go to the bank on my lunch break and then after I finish with work, then I'm going to do this and then I'm going to do that because when you wake up in the middle of the night and you're like, oh my god, I need shoes <laughs> and, and you can't get back to sleep again, you know, you've got this list there that's like, don't worry. You can get shoes and be like, oh, thank fuck. Now I don't have to worry about my shoes. <laughs> you know, and, uh, and, and like the routine that you do before bed is supposed to be like actually an hour long process to where it's like an hour before you go to bed, you know, like try to wean yourself off of doing anything that's really intense. Whereas like, you know, I had heard like, turn off all your electronics. Don't watch movies. Don't do this. Don't do that. You know, and it, he was like, no, 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 no. That's like, that's total extremism. What you don't want to do is like watch a thriller 
right before you go to bed, because that's going to put you in a tense situation. You can watch comedies, or you can watch, like, light humor or something like that, you know. Don't watch anything where you're going to wake up in the middle of the light, night and be like, he's coming to get me! So I have this, like, hour-long process that I'm doing before I sleep now, and it's it's working out. I, like, read for 20 minutes, and I, there's a hot shower and tea. It's great. I'm getting old. I just like it's 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 getting to the point in time in my life where I realize that I need to sort my shit out. Yeah. You know, like you know that uh, you guys have you seen the whole season two of Rick and Morty? Yeah, that's my uh, that's my alarm in the morning when when uh, Morty says get your shit together. That speech. Yeah, like that that whole speech right there was is basically what I'm in the process of doing right now with with my life. I'm just kind of like. I need to, I need to get my shit together. Yeah. You know, like I need to uh, dedicate more time to sleep, dedicate more time to making sure I'm in good physical shape, like stop wasting my time with with shit that I don't enjoy, you know? Stop like stop fucking like maintaining uh, uh, connections with friends that that do nothing but sort of like aggravate me, you know, stop stop convincing myself that I'm going to tie myself to obligations that are just going to drain me and I'm not going to get anything out of, like, focus on what's making me happier in life, you know, stop, I used to spend so much time as a young man being bored, like, actively being bored, you know, like, lying around being like, there's nothing to do, I'm so bored, and I just don't have fucking time for that shit anymore. Like, when I get free time, I want to do something with it now. Yeah. So that's that's what I've that's basically what I've been doing for like the last two months. If I've seemed like I've been a little quiet on the podcast, is because I'm, I'm sorting my shit out. Well, I, I'm glad you're getting your shit together. Me too. Okay. It's, I mean, it's still shit, but at least it's well organized. All right. Okay. Uh, any other topics before we jump into questions? I've only got a few. And then we uh, can... I mean, I have, like, ten, but... <laughs> you have ten. Let's do yours. You have, like, a list. I have, like, three. Oh. Well, I mean, I asked earlier, so there's more time for people to reply. Yeah. I um, oh, man. Some of these are heavy. All right. Well, let's we'll we'll try if 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 we don't. So want right, to. I can handle it, Austin. I've got my shit together. Yeah, and if we don't want to, we'll say next. <laughs> I guess we have that power. I mean, yeah, I mean it's our show. I okay. I'll, just, I, I'll just edit it out. Let's start with the most important one. Stim powered giraffe, which remains an awesome username, asked if you, Leon, and Johnny had to make gem sonas. What would your gems be and why? This is de- this is a dire and serious I, question. I assume that this is a Steven Universe reference. Yeah, I, I, you right, haven't even watched the have show to... and you know that, and I love you, Johnny. You're I'm, the best. I'm just I'm just picking up on things, you know. Uh, but would you guys be so kind as to explain this to me? <laughs> oh, oh, you you um you're you're a gem. You you have to pick. Uh, like a thing, like a, a diamond or whatever, and that's... Every character in Steven Universe is named after a gemstone, and they all have, like, an associated power and weapon. So, like, Garnet is a character, and she has, like, giant gauntlets, and she can see the near future, for okay. example. All right. Uh, Amethyst has a whip. She's, like, a shapeshifter. Okay, so we're talking, we're talking basically, like... We're talking, uh, you gotta pick a stone and then be like, here's my weird power and this is my weapon. Yeah. I, I would be, uh, Cubic Sacrania. And, <laughs> and I would have the power to just become invisible. Cause nobody likes that. Nobody likes those. Uh, uh-huh. so my, my, I would be all just self stealthy and not have to fight. And, uh, my, that would also be my weapon too. Just not fighting. Is this the nerdiest thing we've ever done? Yeah. No, no, come on. We've been doing this for a long time, and we have a podcast about playing Dungeons & Dragons. Oh, yeah, shit. This is not not the nerdiest thing we've done at all. Nowhere near the nerdiest thing. Oh, God. I can't do this. This is too. This is like. This is like. Oh, what's your. uh, What's your fursona? Are you. (laughs) There's no way to answer this with any dignity, and I feel like I've already said that. I, there's like <laughs> the actual existing characters I identify with pretty strongly already. Okay, I'm gonna go with Palisite. 
Um, <laughs> did you Google that, or did you just know that was a thing? No, actually, I know that I know what Palisite is. Actually, uh, years uh, years ago, not long after I first met Stephanie, my 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 lovely partner, um, a few months after we started kind of like seeing each other, she went off on a trip to Thailand and came back with a gift for me, which was which was a, a tech type pendant. And I was like, oh, my God, you got me a space rock. That's so amazing. Um, yeah, so it, and it was at that point in time that I started doing reading about uh, extraterrestrial gems. And, uh, like, I just – Palisite – I fucking – I love Palisite. I think Palisite's fucking beautiful. Um, so it would be Palisite. My weapons would be nunchucks. <laughs> Uh, because I think that falls in line with my, like, personal hobbies, at least, anyways. And I can kind of, I can use nunchucks, actually. I, I have been trained in the use of nunchucks. And, uh. Um, Do they give you a certificate? Uh, no, no. I mean, like, they're not, they're actually illegal in Canada, though. You have to, like, you have to have them at a school, because many years ago, some Edmonton police officer got, like, really badly fucked up by a dude with nunchucks. Johnny, huh. in my in my mind, because nunchucks are illegal, I just imagine there's like this metal black case in like a locked uh, secret door in your closet that you go into, and then you open it up, and then like blue light comes out of it, and then you reach in to take the nunchucks. In my like, head, that's what it is. No, this is like this is totally where I'm going though. Is that I, like I you know carry around my nunchucks in a case, okay, like a briefcase, and then like open it up and like flash, and then like fucking nunchucks, you know? And, and my, my, uh, my special power would be um, being in two places at once. Ooh. That's cool. But, like, but, but not being, like, two different people, just being in two places at once. Okay. So that it's like I could, if I was ever interacting in one location, I'd be doing the same thing in the other location because oh. I get the impression that not only would that be really useful, but also quite funny. Okay. All right. Great. Uh, great answers, guys. Uh, Austin, if you don't want to answer at all, that's fine. We can just get to the next one. Um, so I was sitting here thinking about it because I, I, part of me wants to cop out because this is nerdy as fuck and embarrassing, but also because my imagination is what it is, I immediately thought of stuff. Okay. <laughs> um, I would think it. Uh, I would be graphite because that's kind of like a lame, unassuming one, and it's uh pencils, which are nerdy, and I'm I'm something of a writer. Um, definitely my weapon would probably be uh like armor, something like reminiscent of like football arm uh football padding almost. And if I had a power, it'd be uh talking to or commanding animals. Oh, okay. So that's that's what I thought of. Um, let's never speak of this again, <laughs> because, oh god, our reputations cannot handle any more. If this episode had not already been definitely titled Quantum Gigolo, it would definitely be called I Am Trained in the Art of Nunchucks. I <laughs> 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 just love the way that sounds. Alright, oh, go ahead, next question. Okay, um, now here's one, I don't know how much, uh, Leon has to add to this, but I'll ask it, uh, Matthew Collier asked, was the internet unfair to Phil Fish? Me and Johnny actually recorded an entire hour-long podcast, um, one of the times Phil Fish quit the internet and industry, uh, because we were working at Blister Thumbs at the time. If you don't know who Phil Fish is, he is the developer behind the indie game Fez, and he's kind of known for having an abrasive personality. Uh, do you think the internet was unfair to Phil Fish? Uh, I'm not answering. So, <laughs> this is entirely you, guys. You don't know, do you not even know who he is? No, you know I, I, I'm vaguely aware, but I don't remember anything he said. Oh, you should watch the documentary Indie Game the Movie, um, yeah. which is where a lot of people know him from. He was kind of like an eccentric, um, guy who, like, famously, like, freaked out at one part of the movie. <laughs> All right. Like, yeah, okay, he can be a little bit of a dick sometimes, and he put his foot in his, ma- in his mouth a couple times, but, like, yeah, a lot of people do. Like, he still made a pretty good game. I don't... Well, fair? Like, you know, the world doesn't owe you fairness, really, and the internet is fucking vicious, so, like, sure, feel free to criticize the thing he says, but I think it, the kind of reputation he accrued is absurd, considering uh, the relatively <laughs> minor... Did, uh, I'll just ask this because, again, I know almost nothing about him. Did he ever take back what he said, or like apologize for it, or was he just like adamant about it? 
and sat in a corner. Which, uh, what, what thing? The thing about, um... Japanese oh, video game stuff? Yeah. yeah. Oh, uh, he, no, no, I mean, you know, like, he, he came clean and clarified, but... I mean, a lot of a lot of the publication about that statement was really in, like deliberately inflammatory. Okay. I mean, it was like an off the cuff generalization. Like people do that all the time. We do that. I did that in this episode already. Like it doesn't make you like a bad person. It's yeah, just, but I'm always right. So. Yeah. I mean, that helps. But we. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Okay. No. In all seriousness, um, he can think that the best games don't come from Japan anymore. I like all my games. Almost all of my favorite games come from Japan now, um, or always did, but that's me. Um, I don't, I mean, I don't know what the exact, uh, fractions are in terms of great games coming from Japan and great games coming from America and great games coming from France or whatever, but. You know what's funny? This really illustrates how much the game has changed in terms of internet outrage because a couple of years ago, something like that, someone stating their their preference in a, a def- manner that seems definitive and a little bit jerkish was enough for, like, a full-blown controversy. But, like, nowadays, like, people don't even, like, bother reading the call-out posts unless there's, like, a bomb threat involved. Like, shit has elevated to such a polarized, vicious level that, like, the whole Phil Fish thing, in retrospect, seems, like, kind of silly. I like my 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 initial response to his statement about Japanese games if I could you know channel the dude on this one is that's just like your opinion man and that's I, all I just, it really warrants I, well, yeah like I don't understand why it why it it warranted um because we were mad about stuff that like I mean, don't you remember those years when people were really mad about JRPGs and Call of Duty like that was the thing that wait, and like used games people were so mad wait I'm starting to remember bits and pieces about this wasn't the issue not that he said that but that he said that like loudly at a at a panel where he was just kind of intruding on it. I mean, he no, was somebody asked panel. him a question. Yeah, somebody asked him a question. They asked the they asked the panelists. This guy asked the panelists because um, they were like, "Yeah, you guys make obviously these these like in, in games that have been inspired by classic Japanese games like Mario and and." Well, it was a Japanese developer, and he said, yeah. "What can we learn from you?" And he said, um, he, "No, he his question." Things. The question was, oh, I, I just wonder what games that are coming out of Japan right now inspire you. And uh-huh. Phil Fish was like, "Fucking nothing." <laughs> They're trash. Oh, okay. Well, see, it, it, that, that, that's more abrasive than just giving. Like, yeah, he it. said some abrasive shit. Like, um, no one's denying that. It's just in retrospect, like, it's it, none of it matters. Like, it's just a dude who had an opinion. Like, who cares? I bear. I, I, I only now who has developed the sum total of one video game had an opinion, and everybody was like, "No, sir, you must be chased off the internet." So I guess the answer to that question was yes. The internet has been unfair to Phil Fish. I just, um, uh, I just looked not up that the... he wasn't an asshole, but yeah, uh, that's fair. So I guess our consensus is uh, he was a jerk, but maybe we shouldn't have reacted as badly as we did. Next, all right. Pruitt Holcomb asks: Has there ever been a remake, sequel, prequel, slash whatever that has ruined a series or character for you, like you can't enjoy it anymore? Um, we've talked about, like, remakes and stuff in terms of, like, the old one still exists. So I feel like we are going to lean towards no. Yeah. But is, um, is there anything you can think of? I'm pretty annoyed that they're remaking Memento. It's not even out yet, and that bothers me. Look, they're remaking it, but m- what I feel is it's probably a bad idea, but I'm just going to watch Memento. I, I, don't, I don't care. I mean, it's the only... Like, really bad thing, why I think this is, like, a genuinely bad thing for the movie industry, is that it's money that could be spent towards something else. Uh, but beyond that, it's just it's just another movie that I don't have to watch. And I'm so not going to watch it. Um, I'm, just, I'm probably just going to rewatch Memento, because I haven't seen it in a very, very long time. I feel like remakes are more dismissible, because you can just say that the original still exists. But with sequels or prequels that interfere with, like, a timeline or yeah. something, like, like Highlander 2... Like which they're aliens, and so it changes the entirety of how you view the original. I could definitely see that ruining something for you. Like I don't have personally have an attachment to those movies, but I could see an argument where like no, that the fiction is now diminished. Yeah, I can understand that if it uh, alters the canon of a of a film you actually like. Uh, remakes, um, 
I probably there there have been lots of good remakes. I don't think this is going to be one of them. And and I I know that's not fair to talk about a movie that I know nothing about. And it absolutely is not fair and I I recognize that. But I feel like this was already a great movie. You don't you don't need to make another one, you know? We we we, we you got it. You nailed it. It's like it's like if you if you yeah, Why don't we remake bad movies or movies that like could have been good, you right. know? Right. I, I would I would be a lot happier about that kind of thing. Um, the answer is so obvious, guys. It's money. I understand that it's money. <laughs> I mean, from a purely artistic uh, standpoint, a di- a distanced uh, from uh, economics. Uh, what is that, even, Leon? What are you even talking about? Do you hear the words? You're just like saying I'm badness. About, I'm talking about a fantasy world oh, where okay. some where sometimes there is justice. Um, uh, <laughs> Yeah, anyway, um, the, yeah, Memento is getting a remake and I'm just not gonna watch it and that's how I'm, that's my form of protest. Um, but I don't care. That, that's, that's the long and short of it. I don't care. Um, next. Alright, um, how are you, how are you doing on time? Are you guys feeling we should start wrapping up? I have nothing to do. I got a, I have a little bit of time, but I'm gonna have to go soon. All right, because we got like people are asking about like the Syrian refugee crisis and stuff, and it's like, oh. oof. why would they ask you... us? I don't know. I mean, I like that <laughs> people care about our opinion. That's that's nice. I like that. That's a good thought. It's like but we would need like forty minutes to do that justice in any like way. Okay, um, I'll, I'll 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 sum up. Um, the ISIS attacks were specifically meant to make us afraid. I, and and to have us have these kind of feelings about basically about the Muslim faith, that was it. And they we're we're basically by saying we don't want Syrian refugees because they're Muslims, we're doing exactly what they want. They, the terrorists wanted us to do. So uh, if you if you want to do what the terrorists want us to do, then 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 that's your prerogative. But I'm gonna do the opposite of what they want us to do. <laughs> Maybe I'm just a contrarian. Uh, and I'm, I, or, but you know, I think the basic humanitarian thing is to uh, uh, not be a jerk about this. Um, by the way, uh, there was a vote today, and uh, uh, not only Republicans, but a fair amount of Democrats in the House said, uh, "Yeah, let's uh, let's pause on the whole refugee thing." And the president said, "Yeah, I'm vetoing it, so I don't care." So <laughs> that's uh, that's it. All those governors who are saying, we're not going to do it. It's like they're going through a federal program. You, like, literally can't do anything about it. You, you, you're just you're just going to whine. You're not going to build a wall around your state. So they're, they're just going to come in, uh, and, and they'll be monitored federally, not statewide. And that's it. Um, and that's what I think about it. And uh, fucking deal with it, you know. Like, I, I, we could have this huge, we could do an episode just on this. Like, I don't even know how to just, like, bullet points it for anyone. No, but, I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to, uh, to, you know, to take the, uh, uh, the I blame mean, and, and be, you know, standard liberal here. I mean, you did. You basically broke down your opinion into one sentence. For me, it's like, it's so complicated because there's so many components of, like, the, the religious aspect and the racist aspect and, like, the, the security and just the, there's so many different ways to approach it. And it's like, <sighs> I'm not, no say, easy, I'm, not no say, answer. I'm not saying it's simple because the world isn't simple. I'm saying that we can say yes, and that's simple. Mm. I guess, yeah, we, the, mm, I'm, I'm reluctant to say anything because I feel like any, any sweeping broad statement you can make can immediately be complicated by like nuance. That yeah, really needs to be part of the conversation. That, that that's a fair point. But uh, the great thing about me uh, <laughs> talking about this is I yeah. never have to hear back. Ah, cool. <laughs> so, I'll, so that's why I said I'll do it. I'll I'll just do it. We you know we we all have very similar political opinions. So I'll just be the one to say uh, the the thing, and that's it. Um, next, <laughs> Johnny, did you have any thoughts? Oh, I'm sorry, John, um, if you if you want to weigh in because you're from a different country that is not uh, going to stop this. Probably, no, probably the the one thing that I saw that was one of the most tacit um, observations was, was, like, weirdly enough on Twitter. Um, and I, I can't remember who I can attribute this to because it wasn't one of the people that I regularly follow. It was, it was a retweet from someone um, who basically said, you know, for all those people who said that if they could go back in time and do the right thing during the World War II Holocaust – like we have to recognize that we we've got a chance 
right now to do the right thing. And that decision co- doesn't come with weight, uh, like, it doesn't come without weight, obviously. You know, like, uh, we still need to worry about safety and making sure that uh, our own citizenry are are looked after and, and protected. But, I mean, you can easily make the argument that a lot of the time the government isn't looking after and protecting our own citizenry anyways. Um, but we do. We, I mean, you've really got a chance to help disenfranchised, displaced damaged people and look like there's clearly a a good there's clearly like a moral decision which is to help as many people as we can it comes with the risk of of perhaps being the target of a terrorist attack and like either that's an acceptable risk or it's not and i feel like if we want to be the good guys like maybe we need to take a risk yeah like yes like something like i said it's so there's, complicated. There's, there are no there are no heroes in history who risked nothing and won everything. That's fair. It's 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 really about being brave at this point. As far as I'm concerned, I see it, the kind of shit that politicians are saying now about closing the borders, and it just reads to me as cowardice. Like yeah. we're so afraid of being attacked, we don't mind basically closing our eyes to a huge humanitarian crisis. Yeah. And it, it, there there is no way to ensure a hundred percent safety, but there is a way to do as much as we can to help people. Yeah. And that's, that's like the, the most succinct way I can put it. But obviously, oh man, Stephen James Black. Thanks. Wow. For that question. Throw us a softball one next time. Yeah. <laughs> what's, what's your favorite kitten color? <laughs> <laughs> I <Soft>. like black. <laughs> Me too. Oh my God. I was just thinking of that. <sighs> Oh man, sometimes we, I, I feel like we should have like a serious like episode here and there and other times like we get halfway through a topic. I'm like, oh no, this was a mistake. Oh. It's too late. We can't turn back. What is even the show? Well, it's not anything. That's, that's the thing. I always say it, this show is just a conversation that we record. Um, all right. Next question. All right. Uh, Brent asks, have you ever felt bad for liking someone that's nice to you, but is generally a complete asshole? Um, yeah, I'm sure. I'm, I've probably been the person who is an asshole in some situations, but nice to other people. Like, people are, like, that's why people have, like, friend groups, right? Like, because you gel with some people and not with others. And, like, you can be parts of multiple friend groups, right? And, like, sometimes yeah. it's like, you know... Leon might not get along well with one of my other friends, so that's, like, why we don't have a podcast together, and then we have one with Johnny, because we gel, right? So it's like that thing people say about, like, someone who's mean to a waiter isn't a nice person. Hmm. But I don't know if that's true. Like, it's a good, it's a good like, it's some wisdom when it comes to how you conduct yourself. Be nice to everyone. Don't look down on people. But sometimes people don't get along, and sometimes some people are assholes, Right. But if they're I, nice to you, you can still have a relationship with them? I actually completely understand what you're saying. Uh, just because, um, how do I say this? I'm going to say this to try as, as gently as I possibly can. Um, uh, and maybe edit it out later <laughs> if, if, I, if I don't, if this doesn't go well. If you post um, out. Yeah, basically. Um, I'm, I'm a member of a very insular community um, uh, of, of people who review things on the Internet. And we all kind of know each other. Not just Channel Awesome, but, like, the broader community. Even, um, and I'm, like, I, I don't know if I'm a member of groups, besides, I guess, this one. Um, but I, 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 I'm, I'm friends with a, a bunch of people, um, but not all my friends are friends with each other. And yeah, some of my friends genuinely dislike other mem- people who are friends with me. But because of the internet, and because I interact with these people mostly through the internet and at conventions... We can, I can maintain all of these friendships without it being weird and awkward. Well, the difference, I mean, that's is a little bit more public because there are people who care about your friend groups. But I think that's a pretty natural thing. Like in high school, like you have your friend group, uh, like you hang out with, like in the lunch or whatever. But then you have like your friends locally on your block or whatever, and they might not like each other, and that's totally fine. Uh, yeah. You know, you know what I'm saying? I, I, I like the idea of all of your friends being perfect and liking everybody, but it's just not realistic. And I don't think you should feel bad uh, if some of you, like the question was uh, a complete asshole. I think we're assuming that, that, you know, if they're nice to you, that negates the complete part, but 
if if none of my friends are complete assholes, they just have some of my friends have bad blood with other people who are my friends. Um, thanks to some of my forays into uh, the world of video game criticism, journalism, whatever you want to put it, um, I have a number of friends that have fallen down on the other side of a particular movement. Oh my mm-hmm. god. Look, I'm, I'm, we're just sub we're just sub tweeting now. Good I'm job, not gonna guys. Say here. I'm not gonna throw I'm not gonna throw any names out, and I'm not gonna talk about exactly what movement I'm speaking of. I won't insult your intelligence. Uh, I'll just assume that you know which one I'm talking about. Uh, and I have some pretty strong opinions about um, what it means, really, to be a supporter of this particular movement. <clears throat> Um, but you can I, still get along with them, even though they are an asshole to a lot of people on the internet, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and do you and, feel bad about that? Um, I don't know if I feel bad so much as just being like, because uh, you know, like what our friends, if 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 nothing except just sort of a, a either a micro or macro, depending on, like, you know, what, what level of friendship we're talking about here, sets of tribes, like, you know, re- mm-hmm. religious groups who all decide that they have the one true path, or, like, you know, uh, guilds of tradesmen who are all competing for, like, um, contracts or prestige or something like that. You know, like, history is riddled with smaller, larger groups all kind of, like, vying and jockeying for position and essentially competing with each other for for resources, esteem, you know, what have you. So that's, like, not really anything new, but it, it has um, it has colored the way that I see them. Okay. And maybe maybe as a result, um, I, I'm not speaking to many of these people as much as I used to because um, I sort of feel like I have been – I have had some characteristics of theirs suddenly revealed to me, and um, they appear unpleasant. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's completely reasonable because sometimes, and and you know, just like for example, sometimes you can know someone for a while, and all of a sudden you just learn they're a racist or something. It's like, oh, we we've just never talked about race before. It is just never an issue between us. And then, like two years into the friendship, you're like, oh. Um, you're wrong. Uh, I told you guys that my neo-Nazi story, right? Well, I, yeah. I poss- oh, yeah. possibly, but tell us again. I, in in middle school, I had a computer class with this guy, and we were pretty good friends for like you know most of the year. And like he taught me how to use like PowerPoint or whatever because I didn't know because I didn't have a computer because I was poor. Um, and then like halfway through the year, he was just like, "Oh yeah, like uh, you know, I'll hail the Aryan nation." And I was like, excuse me? <laughs> like, he was a totally cool, nice dude. He just turned out he was a white supremacist. And, like, it was very confusing for me because I think at a certain, like, point in your, like, you know, moral development, you just assume there are good people and bad people and that never shall the twain, you know, they it's they're not compatible. But totally wrong people can be nice, right? They can be assholes in a lot of their life. And there can be good people, people who stand up for righteous causes and have, uh, you know, humane beliefs, and they can be insufferable and <laughs> awful in other ways. It's, 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 uh, it sounds obvious when you say it out loud, but I feel like everyone has to kind of learn it. Yeah. That's <sighs> do we have time for more, or does Johnny have to go? Let's do one more. One more. Okay. Um, <laughs> I apologize that we're not going to get through all of them, or any of mine, really, but uh, we... Just, Why don't you do one of yours, Leon? Because oh. uh, I'm looking at these, and there's like, uh, very, these are going to require more depth. Okay. Um, mine are weird. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Can you, you know what? Considering the content of Word Funk, I'm surprised our listeners aren't weird. Err. Uh, you know, like you think we'd attract some real crazy, like disturbed, depraved people who would ask us like disturbing questions, but mostly it's just like, what are your thoughts on this situation or this? product and it's like oh that's kind of normal uh so um the l n g that could um uh, that must mean something i don't know um said um i can't understand this one switchblades in movies 
iconic presence on the silver screen, or trope that needs to stab itself. Um, I don't I, – look, I, I'm sure I've seen tons of Switchblades in movies, but off the top of my head, I can only think of two. One, Is it that wide spread? Yeah, that's what – I'm sure there's, like, tons. But off the top of my head, I can only think of two examples. One is from Seven, and I only remember that because I watched it recently, and they made a point of them talking about it uh, a couple times. Um, the other one is uh, in Crocodile Dundee, where they had a debate on whether or not it was a knife. Spoiler, uh, it's a knife. It's, it's a knife. It's just not as big as Crocodile Dundee's knife. It's a uh, slightly less impressive knife. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Uh, look, I, I, I'm fine with a certain amount of switchblades. Uh, <laughs> I had never considered that it was an issue. Yeah. Um, so. well, no, here, no. This this whole thing is leads to another question. Okay. Who <laughs> has been watching movies and has been really deeply thinking about the number of switchblades? Hang on, hang on, hang on. I just got to weigh in here on the actual switchblade issue. Yeah. Uh, I think we need to keep switchblades in movies because without them, we would not have had one of my favorite jokes from Archer. Oh. Where he pulls, oh, right. it's a long story. He, yeah, he pulls a switchblade out of his pocket, and his mom is like, "Where did you get that?" And he's like, "It's a long story, mother." And then you see a picture of him standing at like a pawn shop window, staring at this like case of switchblades, and he just goes, "Neat," and like that's it. <laughs> oh, there was one in Garbage Pail Kids, um, and uh, I guess any. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So that's that's a thing I thought of just now. Um, I understand being upset by, like, really common tropes, but, like, I, like, do you ever guys ever notice people drink a lot of coffee in movies? What's up with that? Like, I never, that's interesting. I, I'm so. Googling switchblades in film. Um, well, oh my god, there are a lot of them, because the first thing that came up is a YouTube video called Switchblades in Movies 1980 to 1984, and it's, oh my god, and no. it's, and it's six and a half minutes. And there's another one right below it called Switchblades and Movies, 1970 to 1979, and it's eight and a half minutes. And there's Who's like cataloging this. There's several more. There's someone, and I can't pronounce his U- YouTube username, so but I, I, it's it looks like it's pronounced. <laughs> and uh, he uh, documents this. Apparently, it's a thing. Um, look, have we just missed the boat on this? Is everyone I- else really worried? Yeah, I, I, I've just been busy uh, wondering about, um, like, s- more serious stuff uh, in film as of late. So maybe I just missed all the uh, switchblades. Oh, you know what? Uh, Kiefer Sutherland had one in um, uh, Stand By Me. Stand By Me. Yeah, okay. Gosh, there, 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 oh, there have been a lot of switchblades in movies. I apologize, um, the little NG that could. Uh, we dismiss this in sort of a joking way, thinking of only two or three. Uh, there are a lot. I just didn't really think about it until now. I wasn't, I didn't doubt that there were a lot. I was just that, like, how, I'm sure there how, must how did you come to this warriors. question? Well, you know, it, it, yeah, it's, it, it makes sense to use switchblades in film because, you know, motion in, in, in film, you know, sort of catches the eye. You know, you want your camera to move, you want your, your people to move, static shots are boring, and switchblades, uh, by definition, click and come up. So, you know, they're cool. You, you, you do it and you, then someone in Foley makes the sound and it's awesome. So, yeah, I guess it kind of makes sense for both from a uh, visual, you know, motion, and uh, an audio thing, because when you just hold a knife out, it's not making any sounds. But the switchblade makes a sound, and uh, and you have to click it. So, yeah. Actually, switchblades are, the, like, the perfect blade for motion pictures, now that I think of it. Um, I just never had until this very moment. So, no. So, no. To answer your question, I think there's just enough. I think there's just enough. Good. This has been a strange episode, even for word punk. Yeah. Um, like not, it's not, like, outrageous or, like, you know, sexual, like some of our weirder episodes. It's just been a bunch of really dissonant topics. Yeah, no. There's, like, uh, you know how, like, um, sometimes we just flow into one thing or another in sort mm-hmm. of, like, a, a J. Alfred Prufrock kind of thing? Uh, <laughs> but, but, no, this is just, like, I'm just, just like, uh, an eclectic mess. Um, so, okay. Uh, anything we want to say before we go? Oh, is that we're ending it on switchblades? I guess we have to. I mean, that was the, we said one more question, and we took a while on that one, more than I thought we would. Huh. Guys? No, I mean, 
if we're done, I guess the... Do you guys want to talk about Fallout more? <laughs> pay, pay your taxes, but, you know, that doesn't mean you have to be happy about it. Yeah, uh, at this point in time, we can just end a show by me saying something like, Let's get sticky! <laughs> what okay. are you going to do about it? 